Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Jason Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this time. Open up our hearts to receive your word. It's manna, it's bread. We can use it this week. It's practical. Lord, your word is also seed planted in the deep, good soil of our hearts. And it produces life, takes root, produces fruit, transforms us more and more into the likeness and image of your son, Jesus. Holy Spirit, be our teacher this morning and teach us what we need to know. Prepare us for what is coming in our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. You can be seated. And I welcome you. I welcome those who are watching as well. If you're ever in the Mesa area, please come hang out with us. And don't forget about our daily Bible study. You can go to YouTube and type in daily Bible study. We do a morning scripture. We pray over your day. We have a lot of fun. It's me and my brother. We share about what we've been preaching on that weekend. It's a great way for the church to keep meditating on the word that you hear on the weekend. How many of you enjoy the daily Bible study? Wake up, yes? And grab a sticker out there in the foyer, by the way, if you want one, put it on your hydro, it says wake up, and gives you something to talk about with family and friends. Well, today I want to talk to you about standing in faith. I was, uh, took Matthew to his first soccer game when he was about three and a half years old, just this little guy. I was the dad standing on the sidelines, cheering him on. He gets out there in the very first soccer game with all these other little kids. They seem way too little, they don't really know what to do, just kind of kicking the ball, kind of really running around the ball. And suddenly Matt gets just clobbered. It might surprise you to know that in my household, usually my kids were the smallest on the field. (laughs) You wouldn't know it now, but he just got slaughtered. He he just fell down. A bigger kid just ran him over. He got up real fast. He looked at his dad. He wanted to see what I thought. And I could tell he was thinking either I'm going to run out of this game crying or I'm going to go back in fighting. He wasn't sure. Should I go fight that kid or should I come to you and cry? And you know, mom's got to stare. When, when they stare, it means you better do what I say. You ever seen the mama stare? They don't even have to say anything. They just stare at you. Dad's got to stare too. And dad's stare looks like this. It goes, I, he looked at me like, what do I do? And I went. And all I had to do is this. That's all dad's got to do. With a, with a boy, you just go. And you should have seen his face. He goes like this. He goes. Three and a half years old. So cute. He's the smallest guy in the field. He just runs out there and he starts just kind of doing this with his hands and kicking that ball. And he kicked the ball all the way down there and kicked it right in a goal. And dad goes, whoa! And Matthew goes, whoa! And he runs back and they put the ball down and there he goes again. And he kicks the ball and he goes down there and kicks a goal. Whoa! Whoa! 14 goals. 14. I'm not kidding you. It was embarrassing. We wanted the coach, can you just get him out so some of the other kids can kick the ball? Why did I leave him in that game? Why did I leave him in the fight? I don't want my son to get knocked down. I don't want him to get his feelings hurt. I don't want my daughter to get feelings hurt. I want, I want life to be easy for my kids. I want life to be blessed and full of joy. That's what I want for them. So why would I leave him in there? I left him in there because I wanted him to grow. I wanted him to learn that when... When things come at you, you root down. You stay in the game. When it gets tough, when it gets too hot to be in the kitchen, you got to stay in the kitchen. When it gets too hot to be in Arizona, go to San Diego. <laughs> the other day I was out by the pool with my family. where we were. Le- it was so hot out there. I thought, this has got to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. We were walking inside. I told my wife, don't look back. <laughs> it's so hot here. When it gets hot, sometimes we run when pressure and stress comes. But here's the reality. Last week, we learned how to step out into faith. When God leads you to a new territory, you take a risk. You step out of the nest. You jump out into that dream. You start chasing that thing God laid before you. You go to the land that God showed you. You don't want to get stuck in the wilderness, but you step into that Jordan when it's at flood stage. You take the risk, and God miracles manifest in that moment. I want you to know something. When you get to the land that God has given you, that the enemy will immediately try and push you off that land. And when he does, he comes at you. You got that job that you wanted, but now here comes the persecution from the coworkers and the boss. It got tricky, it got tight. Do I retreat, do I run away? Do I learn how to stand in faith? 
Resist the devil and he will flee from me. I got into that marriage, but how many know that that marriage is going to hit some windy times? It's going to hit some tough times. I got into that relationship. I started to write that book, but suddenly I got hit with a stress. I got hit with an attack. It got difficult. You got a bad doctor's report. You were standing in health. You even got your healing before, but suddenly some new report came out. Am I going to stand in faith or am I going to give up the fight? The addiction that you got freed from, you had a relapse, you fell off the wagon, you hit the ground. What are you going to do now? Just decide that it didn't work. I'm going to go back to my old way of life. No, you're going to stand firm. You're going to get yourself back up and you're going to stay on the land because God has promised you this. I will bless you in the land that I have given you. Has he given you some land? You set your foot on it. You stay like a tree. Biosphere 2 was finished in 1991. It's here in Arizona. It's it's this kind of controlled environment. The idea was to build a controlled environment for plants and air and water and living things. That they maybe, as they experiment with this, they could put one of these things on the moon or on Mars so that man could live and flourish, grow crops in a controlled space like this. Big bubble. And and one of the things that they thought that they would would experiment with is how how the air recirculates and how does the water uh, stay filtered and how do we create this sustainable environment. They had all kinds of experiments they were going to run. But they say that one of the most important discoveries was not something that they were even searching for. The discovery that they found was that as trees grew in the biosphere, they would just fall over. They seemed to grow just fine. They reached a certain height, they just fall over. They wouldn't stay in the ground. And what they did is they began to test this as they found out that the wind was missing from the environment. That when a tree bends by the wind, it triggers a mechanism that tells the tree to deepen its roots and to strengthen its core. And without those two elements, without wind pushing on it, having a deeper root and a stronger core, it would just fall over. I want you to know that when it gets windy, it means you're about to grow. You just stand firm and God's going to grow you. He'll do the fighting on your behalf, but your job is to stand. Jehoshaphat and the Israelites and the kingdom of Judah were being attacked by the Moabites and the Ammonites. Jehoshaphat prayed. It looked impossible. There was way big an army coming at them in Jerusalem. There was no way they could survive. And, And part of Jehoshaphat's prayer as he prayed, he was like, God, you're bigger than this. You're over all the kingdoms. How many know we have to remember when we pray to get eternally minded that God is bigger than our circumstances? He said, you have all the might and you have all the power. And then he said this, we were good to the Moabites and the Ammonites in the past. We've never wronged them. When we came through the wilderness, we didn't attack them. And now here they are attacking us. I want you to see this scripture that Jehoshaphat prayed. Second Chronicles chapter 20. See how they are repaying us, right? See how unfair this is. We were good to them, and they're coming after us. And it says this, coming to drive us off the possession you gave us. That's exactly what the enemy wants to do. You get settled in that new position. You stepped out in faith. The enemy now wants to push you off that land. He wants to press you and pressure you to retreat off the possession that God gave you. It's exactly his plan. And you say, well, it was so unfair. It's so unfair how they treated me. I want you to know something. Satan is not trying to be fair. He doesn't have fair in mind for you. He wants it to seem unjust and unfair. What did Jehoshaphat do? He turned and prayed. The next thing that we hear hear is God replying to him. This is what God says to Jehoshaphat. You will not have to fight this. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. You're going to see something before it happens. Do you see that? You're going to see the deliverance the Lord is going to do. He didn't do it yet, but I want you to see it as though he did. Do you see that? See what God's going to do. What's your job? Stand firm. See the deliverance. Who's going to fight? God's going to fight, for the battle is the? The battle is the Lord's. See the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Then he goes on to say, and do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. This has got to be our heart, too. When it gets windy in that crazy circumstance, 
When you get persecuted, when the enemy's coming at you to try and push you off the land. You started the business, but here comes the enemy to try and push you off that land. It's not going to work. It's going to fail. The enemy comes at you to try and push you off your marriage. Try and push you off that dream that you started chasing. Try and push you out of the race that God led you into. When he does that, super simple things you can do. Stand firm. Just stand firm. Standing firm is standing in faith. Standing in faith is so simple, it just means that I determined that I'm going to be immovable from the position I'm at. I don't care how loud or how many the enemy are. I have determined in my heart I'm not going to pay attention to the circumstance that my eyes see, but I'm standing in faith and I'm giving it to God. This battle is not mine. I couldn't win even if I fought myself. This battle belongs to the Lord. Lord God, I'm just asking you. You take this battle, I'm, I'm going to stand firm and believe you, and I'm going to see the deliverance that you're bringing me. Amen. Well, Jehoshaphat got the praisers out, and they began to praise and worship the Lord before the army even went out. This is an amazing story. And as they did this, the Bible says that the, the enemy began to fight each other. And they killed each other. Jehoshaphat and his army didn't have to fight. They just walked down and picked up the plunder. There was so much plunder, it took them three days to carry it all out. What was their job? Jehoshaphat's job. Pray and praise. You see, praying will keep me staying, and praising will anchor my attitude properly. It's so easy when I'm under attack to get discouraged. That's why God said, don't be discouraged. Because the real battle is happening in here. It's not happening out there. It's my attitude. How am I feeling? Am I feeling discouraged? Am I feeling like I want to get them back? The people who are attacking me. You know, he didn't tell me to fight. He told me he would fight. My job was to give it to him. He told me to praise and to pray. These are my two jobs. Pray and praise. Get my happiness back on. Don't let other people or circumstances change or control how you're feeling. Don't let Satan's attack steal one moment of your joy. He might be coming at you, but you don't have to let him have your day. Discourage you. Put you in a bad mood. Decide you're going to wipe everyone else out. Decide you're going to draw up your battle lines. You're going to post something on Facebook about those awful people. You're going to get them back. No, you just remain quiet. You let God do your fighting. It may be unfair what they've done to you. They may deserve to have those words come out of your mouth, but it's better just to pray for those who persecute you. Give the whole thing to God, the great reconciler, and let him have the battle. He's going to be more victorious than you ever would. He can do a better job than us, can't he? There was a man named O'Brien Schofield that I spoke to just last a, a couple weeks ago. After preaching a message, he was here at our church, and Brian Schofield is an NFL football player. He told me his story. This is his story, 2010, he was graduating from college, he'd been playing college ball. He was ranked number two defensive end. He was going to play in the Senior Bowl, which is the all-star game for, for players, to kind of feature the draft picks to the NFL people who would be doing the draft. And in practice, as he prepared for that game, and he was getting ready to go early, and go to the NFL and have a big contract, he tore his ACL. Now, in the NFL, an ACL tear is pretty much a career-ending problem. Very difficult to come back from this, especially when you haven't even gotten into the NFL yet. Three weeks before the draft, he tears his ACL. Looked like it was over. Everybody told him around him. The journalist in this article told him, that's, that's it, you're not going to make it. You'll probably never go on. It's, you know, there's no hope for you now. His friends, well, you might as well give up. You had a good run. He said a lot of people got real negative, and I had to learn to push out the negative. I couldn't talk or let those things in. He said, this is what I said. And I actually read this in the article. It says, I'm not going to let this stop me. I'm not changing my goal. What did he do? He decided, I'm going to be immovable on what God's put before me. He brought me to this land of football. And I am not getting off this land of football. I'm staying with it, and I'm not giving up. <clears throat> well, during the draft, he went kind of late, but he did go. With the Arizona Cardinals, he entered in kind of an injured reserve kind of list, sat on the bench for a little bit. But he began to play. He began to get some sacks, began to get some tackles. 
after four years with the Arizona Cardinals and after a botched ACL surgery. He said that it was, it was so bad, the surgery, that now whenever I walked, there was pain. It was bone on bone. It was pain. He said, I would anoint my knee every night with oil and I would speak to it. No, you're still going to play. You're not going to have pain. You're going to be successful. And he, he would not give in. He said it was a mindset that he had to be immovable. After four years with the Cardinals, they cut him. It looked like it was over. People got around him again and said, well, that was it for you. You had a good run. You got to be in the NFL for a few years. You got to play some games. You had some good sacks. You did well, but it's over. There's no hope for you now. After three days of standing in faith, the Seattle Seahawks called him up on the phone and said, why don't you come out here and at least work out for us? He went out there in prayer, speaking to that knee, anointing it with oil. Bone on bone, he said, I didn't feel any pain at all. Every time I took the field, the pain would go away. And he performed amazingly, and the Seattle Seahawks signed him as a defensive end. Not only did they sign him, but he did amazingly well that year. And they went to the Super Bowl that year, and he got himself a Super Bowl ring. Come on and give the Lord a hand clap. It would have been so easy just to give up, to walk away from that dream. It didn't happen for me. The circumstance was too hard. Things went wrong. Oh, well. And just let it go. But he learned this principle. If I stand in faith, God will do some fighting for me. God will move things around on my behalf. He could have gotten discouraged by getting cut from the cardinals, but now he sees that was the hand of God moving him into the blessing that he might have a Super Bowl ring and play with one of the greatest teams to ever play. Do you see the difference? When you learn to stand in faith, God takes over and starts to do miraculous things in your life that you could have never done on your own by your own effort. Why? Because you stood and you got to see God fighting for you. Come on and give the Lord a hand clap right now. We've got to get around the right people. People who have been through it and are standers. There's lots of people that will quit and retreat and run and tell you to do the same. There's lots of people who will persecute you. You, know, you don't need to be friends with the people who don't like you. You want to have people in your heart and in your world that are lifting you up, pushing you on, telling you to stand, telling you to get back up, try harder. My brother is that in my life. My dad is that in my life. You got to get people around you that will push you. When you say, I'm not sure if I can do this, if I can keep standing, if I can endure, they're not the people that say, well, you should just quit. But they're the people that say, you just keep standing. Let me pray with you. There's a man named George Mueller. He was born in 1805 and he moved to London. And his story just really inspired me. I thought I'd share it became a pastor at a church there, and he started seeing the, the need for helping with orphans in London in that time. So he started to take orphans into a house, and over time, over his lifetime, actually, he and his wife Mary watched and raised 10,020 orphans in that city. As he began to do this, he was met with great persecution. The city didn't want him there. They didn't like all the orphans in the houses and all the noise they were having. The government tried to push him out. The media attacked him and tried to push him out. The high society people were trying to push him out. They said, you are, they were mad at him because of this. They said, you are raising the poor above their natural station. And he was. These orphans would come out of his schools and they were highly educated. They would get the good jobs. They would start the good businesses. And high society didn't like them moving out of their natural station. Nowadays, history bears him out as a great hero. But in the time that he lived in, they tried to push him out. Some cool stories I want to share. One day it says that he was out of food. There was 300 kids that needed to eat breakfast that morning. And he went ahead and set the tables. It's a well-documented story. He set the cups, set the napkins, the plates, the forks and knives, spoons. He got all the kids to sit down. He even blessed the food. At the end of the prayer, there was a knock on the door. There was a baker who said the Lord had sent him there to feed all the kids that morning. And as he brought in the bread, listen to this, a milk cart broke down right in front of the orphanage. And he thought, well, this must be divine providence. And he gave all his milk to the kids too. What a great story. He was immovable. He was a mighty man of faith. There's a story of him being on a boat and he was traveling to preach at another church across the sea. And the captain came to him and said, well, I don't know what your itinerary is, but we've got to turn back. We're not going to make it. He said, oh, yes, we are. He was just a standard. He didn't know how to give up. He didn't know. He's like, God sent me here. I'm going to stand. He said, give me a quiet place where I can pray. He took him to the captain's quarters and he prayed. As he finished praying, the captain began to pray, too. He was so moved by watching George Mueller pray. So he started to pray, too. But George Mueller turned around and said, don't do that. He said, my prayer has already been answered. 
They walked out of the captain's quarters and the fog had already lifted. That's a powerful story. When we learn how to be standers, we see the mighty hand of God move in that way. You know, listen to what he said, this quote that he said, to learn strong faith is to endure great trials. I have learned my faith by standing firm amid severe testing. They tried to push him out. It would have been easier for him just to go to a city that would like him. You know, there's lots of cities that probably appreciate his desire to help the orphans and the poor, but not London. He could have went with that old saying, go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. I love that saying. Boy, I wish that were scripture. That would be one of my favorite sayings. But God keeps sending me places where I'm not celebrated. I don't know about you, but it seemed like I'm, I, I'm sure thankful that Jesus didn't just go to the places where he was celebrated. He went to places where they opposed him to his face, where they came after him, where they were trying to kill him. Praise God that we have a Jesus that came here, even though a lot of people didn't celebrate him, because he saved us all. You get around people like George Mueller, you got Jesus on the inside. You get around people like my dad, you get around people like Ken Du, around people like Michael Behe, people who endure great persecution because of where God positioned them. You think, well, how did you do it? You ask my dad, how did you do it? You might even say, Pastor, I I have a lot of suffering I'm enduring right now because I started this thing. You know, the response you'd probably get from a man like my dad would be a snicker. (laughs) Opposition, suffering. Let's talk about it, man. When he decided to build these domes and God put that on his heart to put, I'll tell you what, the whole city came against us. Whole city came, came, city managers, council people, they all sat him down for a meeting. Put me and my brother were there too and they sat him down and said, listen, we're so sorry, but you're not going to be able to build that building. We're not going to let you put that, those domes on Val Vista and Brown. We're stopping you right now. Our apologies. You know what my dad did? Well, we're going to build it anyways. When you get, the, the media was against us, the neighbors were against us, the society was against us. All great people, I'm, I love our city officials, I love our neighbors, I love our city and community. We just pray for those who sometimes come against us. We don't get mad at them, we're not trying to fight with them. Listen, God will fight for you. My dad's job wasn't to create a fight and a stir and attack them back. My dad's job was to stand firm in the faith and let God do his fighting for him. When God does your fighting, you're victorious be around some people like that. You know, Jesus can take the heat. Did you know that? You might be sitting in there, sitting in that hot spot thinking, man, pastor, you don't know how bad it is. Nobody could endure this. You know, here's the thing. I might agree with you. I might say, yeah, that is bad. But Jesus is on the inside of you and Jesus can take the heat. We do not have a high priest who didn't take the heat for us. We don't have a high priest who didn't stand and face the people that he was healing and there to save as they spit on him, yelled at him, Oh, if you're such a man of God, if you're the son of God, why don't you come down off that cross taunting him, sarcasm, beating him? What did he do? What did our Jesus Father forgive him? For they know not what they do. Jesus wasn't a doormat. That takes bravery and courage. That takes an incredible amount of strength to stand there. And I want you to know that however bad it might get in the land that God has given you, I want you to know that you have Jesus on the inside of you. There is something deeper in you that's stronger than you could possibly imagine that can take all the heat the world can give. Somebody say amen. It doesn't matter how bad they come at you. Jesus is on the inside. See, the thing is, is the flesh and the emotions, they want to get the better of you. But don't let them. Don't let your emotions determine where you... See, your feet will always follow your feelings. That's right. So if your feelings are you know, just getting stirred up in your mind, you're going to bed, you're thinking about how unfair this is, and you're thinking about the persecution and how bad... You know, it would just be easier to quit it all and move to, to, to Rocky Point and drink a Corona on the beach. Can I get an amen out there, Lord <laughs> Jesus? Wouldn't that be easier? But that is not the plan of strength. Is it? That's not the plan of fulfillment, of fighting and advancing God's kingdom in your life and to seeing the victory of your dreams coming to pass. Part of that plan requires you to draw on a strength you didn't know that you had. And when your flesh is saying, I don't want to do this, and your emotions are saying, it's unfair and I'm hurting inside, you call upon the strength of Jesus Christ on the inside of you. Do you know where he is? He's right in here. And he's deeper than your emotions. And he's deeper than your flesh. He's, the, he's more you than your emotions in your flesh could ever be. Because I am crucified in Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. I got a strength on the inside that just won't give up. I got bulldog tenacity. Somebody say amen. 
What are we learning to do? Pull on the strength of Christ. And so often we hear the phrase fight or flight. You get in, stuck in the wind, you get stuck in a drama, you get stuck in a in the natural reaction. You see it on the news all the time. Well, I went into fight or flight. But you know, neither actually is correct there. I almost rhymed. Fight or flight. Neither is right. <laughs> I don't fight. I don't persecute those who persecute me. And I don't run. I just stand firm. Settle down and see that God is God. Let him do the fighting on your behalf. Your job is simply to say, I'm immovable. I'm not moving from this position. I'm going to pray and I'm going to praise. I'm going to go to bed happy tonight. I'm not going to let them steal my joy. I'm not going to let them steal my sleep. I'm just going to have a good attitude in all these things. I'm going to control how I'm feeling. When Moses was leading the Israelites and they got to the Red Sea, it says the Egyptians were chasing them and the chariots were bearing down on them. And the people of Israel, 600,000 on foot, were hemmed in by the sea and they were hemmed in by the mountains. There was no escape. And this is what Moses said to the people. Listen to this phrase. Moses answered, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. And then he says this, the Egyptians you see today, you will never see them again. You see, when you learn how to stand firm through a storm, that storm that the enemy brought you, that wind that came at your life, you'll never have to go through it again when you can learn how to stand through it that one time. He'll never let that Egyptian attack you again. But if you give up, you got into that environment, it was too much, so you got out. It's amazing how you'll see that Egyptian in your life again. Doesn't matter where you go, you go to a new job, it'll be the same problems, all different people. You go to a new family, it'll be the same problems, just some different faces. No matter where you go, you'll be forced to repeat that. Why? Because once the enemy learns how to make you quit something, he'll just keep bringing it back every single time he gets a chance. It's such an important thing that we learn this for our children, too. They may go through persecution. My kids have been through some tough times in high school and public school. But to send them back into that zone, armed and equipped, knowing that we aren't, listen, people of God, we're not defenseless and we're not without a defender. We still go back into that situation. Maybe all the friends are me. I say, just go find some new friends. Find some people who are good to you. Get around some nice people. Don't engage in the drama. Don't fight. Let's pray. Let's let God be our defender. But I send them back in because I want my children to have a little bit thicker skin. Can I get an amen out there? Well, I have too much of a thin skin. Suddenly I find myself bouncing to every place that feels uncomfortable. I leave another place. I leave another place. God keeps taking me to some land he wants to bless me in, but I keep walking off because it got a little bit too hot. No, it's better to raise my kids with that kind of resilience and that thicker skin that says, hey, when it all comes out against me, I've learned how to trust in my God. And every time I did, I saw that God delivered me and he came through for me. Can I get an amen? And sometimes the land that God gives you is hard work. Can I just say that? My, my daughter, she, she really felt led by the Lord to become a journalist major at ASU. She goes to the Walker, Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. It's a tough thing. She's in the Honors College, and so it's a lot of work. And uh, she took this class last year. She was telling me about it. Uh, we reminded me about it. I remember her going through it. That her sophomore year at ASU, that uh, the teacher just stood up there. It was a journalism class and just said, listen, about most of you will not make it through my class. This will be the, one of the hardest classes you've ever taken. Half the kids dropped the class. Half of the class dropped out. That's what most people do. But you aren't most people, are you? You have Jesus on the inside of you. You don't have the same response that the world has. Sure, her flesh may have said, oh, this is going to be hard. She got anxious. She got a little bit worried. But then she remembered that God is with her. And I'll tell you, through all those classes, one of the things that one of the assignments was you have to get published by a real newspaper five times. That's an amazing feat for a kid to accomplish in maybe 10, 12 weeks. And never been published before, doesn't have a single contact in the newspaper industry. She began to reach out, began to trust God. I remember nights where she was up way past midnight with that, that midnight oil burning, working up early in the morning in class, working hard. Sometimes the land God puts us on requires a lot of tilling of the soil. It requires us getting up in the morning, early and going to bed late at night. Does anybody know what I'm saying? Sometimes chasing that dream might be a lot of extra labor. It doesn't mean that God's not fighting for you, but there's some stuff you got to put into it. 
You've got to run your race, is what Paul said. Beat your body. Run as one who desires to win the prize. Can I get an amen? So instead of quitting, she decided to stay with it. I want you to know that she got an email from uh, East Valley Tribune early on in this quest. Guy said, why don't you try an article and we'll try you out and see how you do. She wrote an article. They loved it. They published it. Then they published another one. Then they published another one. She ended up being on the front page. One of her articles got on the front page of the East Valley Tribune. She had all this favor. God was working all these miracles in her life. They even offered her a freelance job. They offered to pay her to keep her going. Why? Because God's hand was upon her life. You know what? She could have quit. She could have given up, walked away, tried a different major. I can't do this class. But she stood firm. God led me here. I'm not giving up. A lot of her friends dropped out. And I want you to know this, that at the end of the semester, she got an A in that class. Oh, come on. Because you just get different results when you got the Lord with you. Our job is simply to stand firm. Just kind of close with this in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7. This is what the Lord is saying to us today. Stand here. Because I'm going to confront you with evidence. Before the Lord. As to all the righteous acts that he's performed. For you. And for those who have gone before you. You see, when you stand still and stand firm, you settle down, get your attitude right, decide to be immovable in that land, decide you're not going anywhere despite the attack. I want you to know the Holy Spirit begins to talk to you and he's confronting you with evidence. Evidence of what your Jesus has already done for you. When you stand firm and say, Lord, I'm gonna give you some praise and be thankful in the midst of this battle. And I'm not moving off this land. It's unfair what happened to me, but I'm giving that to you, and I'm going to let you do the battle for me. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit starts to remind you of all the things that Jesus has already done for you. He's like, did you know that Jesus went before you and he crossed the Jordan? Did you know that Jesus went before you and the walls fell down at Jericho? Did you know that your Savior has already defeated Ai and the five kings at Makeda? Did you know that your Jesus has gone before you to release the blood of forgiveness and redemption? Did you know that Jesus has called you more than an overcomer? That he's given you all the strength that you need, all the victory that you need? Do you know that Jesus has already put the enemy under your feet and raised you up and seated you in the high places and given you the name? that you can call upon that is upon every name above every sickness above every disease did you know what your Jesus has already done for you let me confront you with the evidence that you are going to win you are not going to lose you are not without a defense and you are not without a defender you are not without protection and you are not without a protector you are not without redemption and you are not without a redeemer come on and give the Lord some praise Make the little guy sweat today. Lord Jesus. Start with carrying one of the Rod Parsley handkerchiefs and just dab that thing. Jesus has done it all. Our Savior, our High Priest has gone before us. He's the strength within you to not only endure, but the Bible says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He releases his joy when you stand firm. He confronts you with the evidence that God has done it before and he's going to do it again. Is that right? Father God, we just receive this word right now. Anybody here who's been struggling in the stand, Father God, just strengthen us. Plant our feet on that rock firm and give us your joy. We know now to be immovable, to keep praying, and to keep praising. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we're going to continue this conversation on our daily Bible study. You can go to YouTube and type in daily Bible study. We're the number one daily Bible study in the world on YouTube. And we're going to continue this conversation. We do a morning scripture. We pray every day. It's maybe 10, 12, 15 minutes long. Yeah. Subscribe to it. You're going to love it. we got our Married for Life book out there. You know, me and Holly found out that, you know, what destroys relationships? Fights. And you know what? There's a way to get in and out of arguments in less than five minutes and get rid of 98% of all the fights that are going on out there. So, you know, imagine if you got rid of all those fights. Well, how do I do that? How do we get rid of the dumb fights 
and then be able to get in and out of fights in five minutes. And if you enjoy my stories, every chapter has some of me and Holly's dumbest fights. We fought over <laughs> potato salad, flip-flops. I love it. You name it, we have. And so you can get this on Amazon. Just type in Married uh, for Life and Scott Anderson. You see all the books that I have. We want to spend a moment, and if you're watching this and you're not saved, and you don't know where your eternity is going to end up, it's so simple. You know, it's not about rules, it's not about religion, it's not about following a set. It's all about believing. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're saved. Simple, easy. Say this prayer after me. Believe in your heart and you have it. Everybody say, Dear Father, I ask you right now, come into my life, be my Lord, and be my Savior. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for all of my sins and was raised from the dead. I believe that Jesus is the Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. You're saved. Amen. Well, if you want, we would love to have you partner with us in what we're doing. You know, this word that Pastor Scott's preaching, it's going all over the globe, the daily Bible study as well. And you can be part of what we're doing around the world. So I just encourage you, visit wakeuptv.tv. You can donate right there and join the team of believers that are making a difference. And if you don't have a church home, find one. It's so important to a great life that you are planted in the house of the Lord. Remember that this is the day that the Lord hath made. Come on, let's rejoice and be glad in it. See you next time.